I'm not shy. He said he's not shy. I said, don't be shy. And he said, I'm not. Today's award to Mr. Palmieri falls under the category of unfinished business. Joe, in recognition of your tremendously successful career in financial services and insurance, your longstanding pride over your affiliation with New York Law School, which you attended but did not graduate from, and for your, even though you've done okay, and for your numerous charitable and philanthropic endeavors, unlike like the rest of you students who are graduating today, the law school is proud today to bestow on you, at long last, the law degree that you started 50 years ago. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Ask him if he's going to study for the bar tomorrow. <laughs> Thinking of it. <laughs> wow, here's your diploma. Wow, that's cool. That's A cool. diploma. Thank I'll you. hold it. Thank you. Talk. you want to take a picture? Arthur. My fault. How you doing? You doing all right? I stand before I stand between you and the thing. All the speakers, I'm the last one. So you want this to go on, right? <laughs> nah, come on, tell the truth. I, I want to thank uh, uh, Chairman Abbey, and I want to thank Dean Kroll. Uh, I, uh, this is an unbelievable occasion. I want to thank the faculty. I want to thank, uh, I want to thank everybody, actually. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm here, I feel like Pavarotti with the, this is really cool, this is a, I can't tell you. This is cool. You're giving an honorary degree to somebody to quit. It's true. You, you, you have no idea. I, I don't like standing behind there, so you don't mind this, do you? All right. Um, uh, it's true. 47 years ago, I attended New York Law School and I quit. Uh, but you are responsible, this school is responsible for whatever has happened to me that's been good. Because if I did not go to this law school, I wouldn't have wound up with the job that I wound up with at Carter, Berlin, and Wild that I'm gonna to talk to you about in a minute, okay? I'm gonna tell you a story, you don't mind to tell a story, right? Okay, um, you gotta understand that um, uh, there are, there's a million three hundred thousand uh, lawyers uh, in this country. Um, don't feel bad. Uh, there's five to ten million executives. Um, and when I became an executive, there was probably four or five million executives, and they weren't hiring short Italian guys. So you got to understand, you got a shot. What's really important is not the fact that there are so many people vying for jobs today. What's important is that there aren't many people who are compelling at what they do that make themselves so obvious that they can't help but choose you because of who you are and what you represent. The world is full of competent people, but the world is not full of compelling people. I want to talk to you about the things that I think will make you compelling. At least it's made me compelling. Uh, I want to share it with you. And there's some things that if you think about them, you, you, they, they act as guideposts for you, then you'll never go wrong. 
and you'll find that your sense of feeling of who you are and the fact that you want to be compelling will be with you all your life. The first one is you've got to have vision. You've got to know where you're going, and where you're going has got to be so focused and so clear that you won't stop until you get there. It's so important that that vision stays with you uh, every day. The vision, by the way, is no good unless it is accompanied next by an emotion. There's lots of people who commit to going doing in the gym in January. But emotionally, they don't buy into and they don't make the commitment that you need to have that vision. I call it the Viking effect. Does anybody know what the Viking effect is? The Vikings were the people who were the bad guys that used to invade countries. You remember those Vikings? You know, from the north. <laughs> now you got it? When they landed ashore of a country they were going to conquer, they immediately burned their boats. And the reason they burned their boats was to commit that they were not going to lose. The vision they had of conquering that country, the commitment they had and the emotion, there was no going back, there was no plan B. They burned their boats. The only way they could get back was to build new boats if they won. How many of you have committed to burn your boats with no plan B? If this doesn't work, I'll do that. If this doesn't work out so good, that is always that. You can't have it that way. The vision has to be so pure, so forceful in your mind that you totally emotionally commit to what that vision is. The next thing you need is purpose. Vision's nice. Emotion and commitment is nice, but you got to have a purpose. It's the glue that keeps your life together. What are you doing here? Why'd you go to law school? Why did I become the head of so many companies? What was my purpose? To make a lot of money? I'm telling you, that's not what it's about. The purpose has got to be genuine concern for what you do and the people you do it for. Whether you're If you're going to practice law, criminal law, or you're, going to, or you're going to work in corporate law, or you're going to use the law to do something else, it doesn't matter what it is. What matters is, is that you have genuine concern for people. It's not about technology. It's not about the internet. It's about people. And if you can have genuine concern for what's good for people, and that's your purpose, you're going to go as far as you want to go because your purpose is pure. It's important to have one. It's important to have one because it's the center of who you are. If you want to know what passion is about, and it's been mentioned many times up here, passion is the marriage of your vision, your commitment, and your purpose. You marry the three together, and that's where your passion comes from. In the absence of those things, you got nothing. If you want to have a vision, you got to go out and you got to find that vision. I call it go play in traffic. Now you're saying, what's wrong with the guy? He wants me to go get hit by a car. That's not what I want you to do. I want you to do is to engage. We live in a society of hopeful authenticity, but it gets filtered through so many various things that or emails, or texts, or LinkedIn's, or Instagrams, and through that filter, we wonder who we are. We gotta go out and engage and play in traffic. That's how I got here. When I entered New York Law School, I thought it would be a great idea to go find a job with a Wall Street law firm and start my meteoric rise to the top. Thankfully, the law school was downtown near Wall Street. So after my last class, I said, let me go knock on some doors, play in some traffic, see what's going on, and find a job at a Wall Street law firm. So I went around to look at directories. This is when you could go upstairs easily. <laughs> and I saw the name Carter Berlin and Weil, and I figured if it's got three names, it's a law firm. 
So I get up to Carter Berlin and Wow, I said, with whom may I speak about a job? I'm not sure I said it that way, but I, that's what I did. And she said, well, this is a small company. Let me see. She says, go down the hall and ask for Mr. Weil. I go down the hall and ask for Mr. Weil. And he said, what can I do for you? I said, I'm going to New York Law School. And then you know, after class, I want to learn the law from a practical point of view and start my meteoric rise to the top. He says, that's a great idea. I said, it is? He says, that's a great idea. What makes you think you can do that here? I said, this is a law firm. He says, no, it's a brokerage firm. So you see, if it wasn't for New York Law School, <laughs> I wouldn't be here. <laughs> you, so he, he, I start to walk out, and he says, no, that's a good, good idea. He says, no, I like your moxie. They put, a they put a desk inside a closet, took the door out of the closet. Half of me was in the closet, half of me was in the hallway. People would knock me in the back of the head, call me Joey, maybe. I was a gopher. I went for this, I went for that. 20 years later, that company became Shearson Lehman Brothers. And I was the president of that company because of New York Law School. That company was part of Travelers Group, which became part of City Group. And so when I tell you that I am so endeared to New York Law School, even though I quit, <laughs> but I quit because I loved the closet. <laughs> I loved what I was doing. I had a vision of being a great Wall Street executive. That was my vision, crazy as it sounds. My grandfather, who came from Sicily and immigrated here, my father, would tell me over and over again to work hard and go after your vision and your dream. And that's what I did. And so if I hadn't gone out and played in traffic and pursued that vision, nothing would have happened. I came to the wrong place, which turned out to be the right place you see later on. So that vision has got to be so important. And the commitment, by the way, I made to that vision was the fact that I dropped out of law school because I was so committed to the different vision. You see how important that is? Go out, play in traffic. Something's going to happen eventually. Something will happen. Years later, I'm the chairman and CEO of the Willis Group. Now, nobody knows Willis. Willis is a British company. I was the first American non-British chairman in 200 years. Do you, th you think it was easy for them to take me? Not only was I not British, but they thought Fonzie came to run this place. <laughs> Fast forward to 2008. Now this company that lost money was now the leading insurance broker in the world. In 2008, I make the worst decision of my life, and I, I buy this company in June of 2008. All of you remember what happened after that. Right, so the brilliant executive makes the biggest deal in a decade in the insurance industry, and it turns out to be at the worst possible time. October comes around, all the banks that were gonna lend me money permanently, and they, they took a pass. Instead of giving me permanent money, they gave me bridge loans. I'm not going to get into that, but you got to, that's a bad thing. <laughs> they were charging me more money than my relatives would charge. <laughs> we do the deal, but it's tough times. The credit markets were closed. In November of that year, my oldest son passes away. So I got back to back adversity. You thought I could dig a hole and jump in it? Or I could face my adversity, face my fears, because they become your limitations if you don't. And you blast through it. In February of 2009, I find that I, now I got this other company. I got five offices in Chicago. I need to be able to merge all these people together culturally and economically. 
So I asked my real estate people, well, where's the most space in Chicago? They said the Sears Tower. It's the largest building in the Western Hemisphere. So I said, I want to see the owner. I see the owner and I said, you got any space? He says, I got space. <laughs> most people were moving out because they thought the terrorists were going to hit them. So it was seven, under 70% occupied. So I said to him, you know, I, I'd like to negotiate a good price for you. And he says, what do you got in mind? I said, I don't want to insult you. He said, no, please, what do you got in mind? I said, $10 a square foot. He said, you insult me. <laughs> the average rate was 35. I finally negotiated 1450. He said, do we have a deal? People in real estate know that's a good deal. 1450, he said, do we have a deal? I said, not exactly. I said, the problem with the building is, you see vision, okay, commitment, all that stuff really works. I said, the name of that building's a jinx. People who hear Sears, they want to get out. They think a terrorist is going to attack them. I said, you should put a vibrant, futuristic, enthusiastic company's name up there. He said, Willis? I said, yeah, Willis. Nobody knew Willis. They thought it was that kid on television. What's up? <laughs> Finally, I said to him, I'll do the deal if you change the name. He comes back the next day. He says, I'll give you, I'll, I'll do it if you give me a million dollars a year. I said, fine, I'll do it. He said, you'll do it? It's the first time I agreed with the guy. And he said, well, what? what? He says, we're going to do it? I said, yeah, I'll tell you why. I'll give you a million dollars a year if you give me a million dollars worth of business. Because you you're not my client. So that way I'll give you a million, you give me a million. We get the deal done. Today that building's called the Willis Tower in Chicago and they told me that was not possible. <laughs> the, night, the night that we dedicated the building, I was on the NBC Nightly News, and Brian Williams said to me, he says, how after all these years did you come along and change the name? It's been that way since 1973. What did you do to make them change the name? I looked into the camera and I said, I asked. <laughs> if you have a vision and a commitment and a purpose, my purpose was to take care of the employees in that, of my company. My purpose was to make sure that the investors in the company did well. They were people. I was genuinely concerned about what was going on. Where is Sharon Sheeran? Sharon, stand up, please. You embody everything. You embody everything that I'm talking about. This is a lady who might be a little bit older than most of you but you're much younger than me. This is a lady who not only raised children, she decided to go to college. She graduated summa cum laude the day her son graduated from college. What a wonderful thing. And somebody says to her, you know, you ought to pursue your dream and go to law school, which I think is cool because she takes the assets and all the stuff you take today and she does a video. And the video that she does, she begins to cry and break down and tell her story as she's sending it to this school. And instead of pushing the delete button and saying, no, that's not good, I'm going to do another take, which is what most people would do because they don't want to share their heart. They don't want to share who they are. She didn't push the delete button. She sent it while she was crying and telling her story. I think people like that in the world are the kind of people we need, people who are themselves. Where is, where is Deshaun Dawson? Where's Deshaun? Deshaun, you want to stand up, please? I met Deshaun before we came on. See, this is cool. This is all about what I'm talking about. Deshaun was in financial services business. He said to me before we, while we were roving up, he says, I was in the insurance business. He said, I was part of the roundtable. If you don't know who the roundtable is, those are the people who sell a lot of insurance. 
And, but that wasn't your dream. Your dream was to go to law school and become a lawyer. Even though you commuted 180 miles a day, and you took care of your father who was on dialysis, you see, the vision was so clear, the commitment was so ingrained in your head, the purpose was there, and you sit here today, I have so much respect for you and everybody in this class, because I'm sure everybody's got the same story. So there you have it. You want to be compelling, you got to know vision, you got to know commitment, you got to know purpose, and you got to know passion. But knowing the words is not enough. Everybody knows those words, but they don't know the music. You see, they know vision, but they don't see it. They know commitment, but they don't sell out to it. They know purpose, but they have none. They know passion, but they don't feel it. You want to go from competent to compelling, you have to be able to take the words and the music. And the music comes from your heart. It's the electrical, visceral feeling that you give off every day that shows people you're compelling, you're obvious, you're better than the next person, and you are so clear and so purposeful in what you want to do. Now you know the words, now you know the music, it comes from your heart. This school breeds people who have heart. The community that I see here, and I do a few of these, is different than most places. This place is compelling. It's what makes you all breathe. You should have so much swagger as you walk out of here. Swagger's a cool word, isn't it? It's cool, isn't it? You got swagger in your hand. Let me tell you, does anybody know what swagger is? Let me tell you what it is, and I want you to never forget this. Got it? Come on, you're, going to, you're graduating from law school. It means you're smart. I didn't even do that. <laughs> North of confident, south of arrogant is swagger. You got it? Let me hear it. North of confident, you come on, this is your graduation. You can't be a lawyer and not be able to talk. What's wrong with you people? North of confident? North of confident? North of confident? Walk out of here with swagger. God bless you and thank you.